Hey guys, Shahid here. We're gonna do a bunch of practice problems together soon using the various techniques that I've been teaching you guys. But before we do that, I want to discuss with you a very special set of cubes that tend to really freak students out. They're called floating cubes. And to show you guys exactly what a floating cube looks like, let's first bring in a typical figure that you guys are used to seeing by now. So analyzing the cubes in this figure is pretty straightforward. But let's for a second imagine what this figure would look like if I were to knock off and remove a few of the supporting cubes. So let's say we remove these two cubes over here and let's remove this one over here. If I do that, what would the figure look like? Well, it would look something like this. Automatically, this figure looks off. There's just something inherently wrong with having cubes with no support underneath. The floating cubes colored in red here look like they are being suspended. And since that goes against what we have been seeing thus far, Students are quick to view these figures as exceptions to the rule, when in reality, guys, they're not. So they do look a little weird, but they don't break any of the cube counting rules that I laid out for you guys in the first video of this series. So instead of being an exception to the rule, you guys should start to view floating cubes as an edge case to our already established principles. So let's focus on some of these red cubes here and run through the rules I had previously outlined for you guys. All right, so rule number one was that the bottom faces are not painted. Now, it's important to note that this rule only pertained to the bottom base layer um, of the figure as it's lying on the ground and therefore paint can never reach it. In contrast, a floating cube can have its bottom face painted since it's not obscured by the ground. So this rule actually hasn't been violated. Rule number two states that all cubes must have at least one face in contact with another cube. This rule hasn't been violated either since all floating cubes have at least one of their faces in contact with another cube. So this red cube has this cube in contact with it. This one has two cubes in contact with it. And this floating cube actually has two cubes as well in contact with it. So this rule is fine, hasn't been violated. All right, rule number three states that cubes are assumed present only if they are supporting another cube or if they're required for the figure to be connected. Now, if you guys remember in the first video, I mentioned that this rule is specific to hidden cubes because those are the ones that we need to make assumptions about. If a cube is directly visible, then there's no need to make assumptions. Floating cubes and the spaces between, uh, sorry, underneath them, like, like so right here, are directly visible. And so honestly, we'll never have to make any additional assumptions about them. Instead, we can just evaluate the figure as presented and make assumptions only on hidden cubes that cannot be seen. So in short, guys, rule number three has not been violated. And rule number four is also an easy one. It hasn't been violated since there are no cases of ambiguity present here. Okay, so now that I've proven to you guys that floating cubes align with the rules that I introduced back in the first video, it's time to briefly mention why these floating cubes have started to make an appearance on the DAT. So if you guys recall, the DAT is administered by the American Dental Association, and it was created in hopes of assisting dental schools in their selection process. So because of this, the ADA is always trying to challenge and accurately evaluate pre-dental students in different ways. And to do this, they not only adapt and modify the range of topics that are tested on the DAT, but they frequently experiment with new question types as well. Another example of this would be raw keyhole questions, which really serve no apparent reason but to stress students out and take up valuable exam time. Floating cubes are no exception. But to be honest, none of this stuff should really matter to you as long as it matters to us. Because at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of any DAT resource to adapt to these changes by updating their content and remaining representative of the DAT. This is something the booster team excels at and it's why we are such a popular resource among pre-dental students. We do our homework and we do it well just so our students can spend less time stressing out and more time preparing for their exams. Okay, so now that you guys know why floating cubes have started to make an appearance, we can dive in and start analyzing them. Okay, so let's start by defining what a floating cube is. Well, a floating cube is an unsupported cube, or put simply, it's a cube without an underlying string of cubes that contact the ground. 
So let's look at a new figure. I have three cubes color coded here and you should be able to tell that they are all of the floating variety. So the red cube here is pretty easy. You can tell that it's um, unsupported and um, it's only got one of its faces touching uh, another cube. So five of its faces will be painted. The blue cube is a little uh, trickier, but still easy because now there's two faces that are touching other cubes, but honestly, it doesn't really matter how many faces are touching. Uh, the important thing is that it is unsupported, meaning it has no cube underneath that is touching the ground. Lastly, we got the green cube, which looks like the red cube, but some students get confused because they say, well, wait a minute, there's a cube underneath this one here that is touching the ground. So it can be a floating cube. But remember guys, our definition says that a floating cube is without a string of cubes that contact the ground. Now, since there's a gap between the green cube and this bottom cube right here, the green cube is undoubtedly unsupported and is therefore a floating cube. So as a rule, floating cubes connecting to one other cube will have five sides painted, okay? Floating cubes connecting to two other cubes will have four sides painted. Floating cubes connecting to three other cubes will have three sides painted. Um, floating cubes connecting to four other cubes will have two sides painted. You guys should start to uh, see the trend here. And um, honestly, this would be as if this green, if this green cube had three other cubes touching it. So one on the top, one on the side, and uh, one on the bottom, which would make it four other cubes. Uh, and honestly, two, two sides would remain painted, this front face and its back face. But uh, at this point, guys, I highly doubt you guys will ever come across these ones since it's difficult to keep them in direct view, but we're going for completion's sake now, so we'll keep going. Um, floating cubes connecting to five other cubes will have one side painted, and floating cubes connecting to six other cubes will have zero sides painted. And that's it. So the concept of floating cubes is actually rather simple when you break it down and understand it. Students are often overwhelmed when they run into these types of cubes, but remember guys, keep your cool and continue ahead. As for practice, the booster team has put together specific tests just for these floating cubes so you guys can get comfortable with the analysis. So feel free to head on over to the websites, datbooster.com, patbooster.com, and give them a try. Otherwise, we will see you next time where I will actually start to do practice questions with you guys using the same techniques that I have taught you throughout this video series. All right, guys. Thanks for watching and see you next time.